Hello, Chem 122 Lab students. This is Professor Garner here. I'm the lab coordinator for the Chem 122 Labs. Today we're going to be doing the second qualitative analysis lab experiment 24. Previously you did group 4 uh, cations, and now today we're going to be studying the group 3 cations. Remember, qualitative analysis is a way of using wet chemical techniques in case your analytical instruments have broken down and are no longer functioning. You can still do some quick little tests and take advantage of selective precipitation of ions. Let's see what we're going to be looking at today. So the separation flow sh uh, scheme for today is quite more complicated in the second uh, qualitative analysis lab, as you see here on the right. Uh, again, we just want to remind you that the residual, uh, which is the precipitate side, is shown with the R groups, like R10, R11, etc. And then the uh, solutions are the ones that are the supernatants, um, labeled as like S10, 11, 12, etc. Usually when we separate these branches, um, we will be separating a, a precipitate or a residual from a supernatant or an S, and one lab partner would work on that particular ion for confirmation of the ion. So the first thing you want to do with this um, group is kind of look and see if you can tell anything from the unknown color. So you'll have some unknown color uh, in a test tube that Professor Hammond will have, and you want to look for any evidence of any of the ions based on the initial appearance of the unknown mixture. Right, so, so the various colors are, if it has some chromium, it could have a dark blue tint to it. Uh, if it has the iron three, uh, you know, you have that kind of rusty red, almost like um, yellowish tint to it. And manganese has pale pink, but this mass, this, uh, this color is often masked by other colors. Uh, and then nickel can have a very pale green color. And then, of course, a couple of the ions, uh, aluminum and zinc in solution, are colorless, so they have no hint of being there if they're mixed with some of the other ions. In procedure B of the procedure, we're going to be precipitating out any of the group 3 ions that could be present. Remember, sodium is present in almost everything, right? Uh, of course, sodium doesn't precipitate, but we're trying to discard any of those uh, group... Uh, you know, four cations in solution from the precipitates of the group three ions, which will precipitate and be part of residual R9. So we're going to separate the um, supernatant and the uh, precipitate in the centrifuge. Um, S9 we normally just discard, um, but when actually doing this lab in person, sometimes we ask you to hold on to some of those uh, solutions in case some of your other test fails. Um, you're going to be asked to wash the precipitate and then um, you know, add some additional 6 molar uh, ammonium and a couple of drops of ammonium chloride to it. Alright, so now we've separated the residual R9 and now we're going to go ahead and uh, separate out any possible zinc as zinc sulfide solid and nickel as nickel sulfide solid. And so to the uh, solution that we're going to, uh, or to the residual, excuse me, uh, we're going to add some, a couple mils of uh, one molar sodium sulfate and a couple mils of one molar sodium hydrogen sulfate or bisulfate. We're going to then uh, centrifuge and save the solution S10, which will be used for analysis of iron, manganese, aluminum, chromium ions. The R10 is where we're going to test for zinc and then move on to uh, test also for nickel in procedure E. Procedure D is the test for the zinc ions, right? So what we're going to do is take the residual R10 and we're going to wash it with um, five mils of DI water, discarding this wash water. Sometimes the precipitates can be what they call colloidal, which are kind of like uh, suspension, milky, uh, less dense solids that don't um, fall to the bottom of the test tube. If that's the case, you can actually disperse the colloid by adding some 
uh, electrolytes to the solution. So in this case, we would add th uh, a few drops of three molar ammonium chloride. Uh, to the precipitate, um, we're going to add one mil of DI water and a couple of drops of six molar HCl to dissolve it. Uh, we're going to centrifuge and save any residual that didn't dissolve uh, to test for nickel in procedure E. To the S11, we're going to then add one drop of one molar theo, uh, thioacetamide, excuse me, uh, <laughs> and one drop of six molar ammonium hydroxide and stir and heat for five minutes uh, to make sure we have sufficient sulfide ions to drive the reaction. Uh, and then we're going to add some three molar ammonium um, uh, acetate um, uh, with drops up to about 10 drops with mixing. And if we get a white uh, or light gray precipitate, then we have confirmed that we have the zinc ions. The reactions that we're doing there are shown in the flow chart um, piecemeal part over here. Uh, we're trying to confirm zinc sulfide over here. This is the summary of the reaction that we just did um, and with the mouth full of words that were hard to spit out. <laughs> All right, I think I've got this thing running again. Okay, so to R11, which is a residual that we um, centrifuge and separated in the previous procedure D, uh, we're going to add two drops of six molar um, nitric acid and evaporate that down to the solution of that down to one drop and then dilute that solution to one mil with DIH2O uh, or DI water and add six molar ammonia until basic and then add three drops of this um, ingredient called uh, dimethylgloxamine, right? Or HDMG for short. Oh boy. <laughs> And we get a red flocculate precipitate that would indicate that we have nickel ions. And so, um, so the reaction that shows the, that precipitate uh, being a red uh, flocculent kind of uh, precipitate is down here. Now we're moving to the other side of the separation scheme. And so we're go moving on to procedure F to test for um, iron and aluminum ions. So to an S10 that we uh, uh, supernatant that we collected earlier, we're going to boil that to remove any um, uh, hydrogen sulfide gas, uh, which smells like sewer gas, and then uh, cool that. Um, while that's cooling, we're going to prep a large test tube with one mil of DI and one mil of six molar um, sodium hydroxide. So it's going to be basic. Um, we're going to, once the test tube has cooled, um, after removing the hydrogen sulfide, we're going to add um, five mils of 30% uh, um, hydrogen peroxide and then add the large test tube um, with the sodium hydroxide in it um, and let that solution stand one minute. One minute. We're going to heat that um, solution, though, to decompose and then uh, finally we'll centrifuge in and uh, save a S12 supernatant for procedure I and J. R12 is going to be used in procedure G to test for the iron. So we're over here on the right side of the reaction scheme over here now. In procedure G, we're testing for the iron uh, ions. And so to R12, we're going to add one mil of six molar nitric acid. If that doesn't dissolve it, then we're going to add a couple of drops of 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide to reduce any solid manganese oxide into solution as manganese and boil to decompose the remaining uh, hydrogen peroxide. We'll cool that solution and then dilute it to two mils with DI and divide the solution into two parts. One part we're going to use to test for the iron. The second part we're going to save to test for the magnesium. So to that first part of the solution split, we're going to add six molar ammonia dropwise until the solution is close to neutral. Then we're going to add six molar HCl dropwise to make it acidic. And we'll be testing that every time we ask to go either neutral or acidic with pH paper, you know, litmus paper. Remember that red litmus turns blue if it is um, 
uh, basic and that uh, red litmus, or excuse me, blue litmus turns red if it's acidic. Uh, and so that's the way you would test it with pH paper or, or litmus paper. And then we're going to um, add up to one mil of 0.1 molar uh, potassium thiocyanate, uh, which is KSCN, dropwise until we get any blood uh, red precipitate, right? Um, uh, or, or, excuse me, it's a complex ion, so it's not a precipitate this time. And so uh, when we get that um, blood red color, right, it's called the red lake. Uh, no, it's called the blood red uh, iron uh, thiocyanate. Uh, that is going to tell us that we have iron in solution. So I misspoke just a moment ago. Don't don't confuse it with the red lake. The red lake is actually for testing the test for aluminum, right? So this was testing for iron. So this is a complex ion of iron thiocyanate ion, right? In procedure H, we're going to be testing for manganese ions. So to the second part of the solution, we separated in part uh, procedure G. Uh, we're going to place it in a hot water bath. And then we're going to add a small amount of uh, sodium bismate and stir. stir. If, if we get a pink color, that pink color will be due to the presence of uh, permanganate ion, uh, which confirms the presence of manganese ions in your unknown solution. So that is the confirmed test down here for MnO4, 1 minus the purple color. For procedure I, we're going to be testing for aluminum. Uh, this is part of the um, fill-in-the-blank um, uh, separation scheme that is often misunderstood by students about um, what happens. Um, because in the original flow chart, we actually shortcutted the, the number of boxes, and in the one that you're asked for your pre-lab, there's an extra box in here. So if you read through the procedure and look through the summary of the steps here, you'll kind of see what actually step is missing. So um, just read through it carefully, and you can kind of figure out what's happening to the aluminum. Uh, I don't have all the chemical equations here um, in the summary um, just because it was just too much to put in this uh, pre-lab PowerPoint. Uh, but um, let's see what we're going to be doing. So to um, a supernatant S12, we're going to acidify that with 6 molar HCl and then add an additional 5 drops to just make the solution, um, um, you know, uh, um, basic with 6 molar uh, ammonium uh, solution. We're going to test that with litmus paper. Again, remember red litmus tape paper would turn blue if it is um, basic, right? This aluminum uh, test is actually very sensitive to pH because uh, aluminum hydroxide is amphoteric. Remember, an amphoteric substance is something that can behave both as an acid and a base. And so there's a very small pH window where we'll get any precipitate that um, um, would indicate we have the aluminum ion. And so sometimes in, in lab, we have to adjust the pH back and forth until we just have a little bit of precipitate. We would then centrifuge and wash that residue, which we're going to call R13. Um, but if we look at the solution, um, we can actually confirm if we have... Uh, uh, yellow to orange, depending upon whether it's basic or acidic, uh, and whether we have any chromate ions in solution. So we actually don't need to do the, uh, the test for chromate um, by, by, by just looking at the uh, supernatant part of the solution uh, when we're doing the aluminum test. Uh, to confirm the aluminum, though, we would take R13 and um, put it in one uh, mil of 6 molar HCl and add two drops of the aluminum ion agent. Uh, we would make the solution basic by adding some drops of uh, 6 molar ammonia. And when that happens, then we get the red lake. There it is, baby. There we go, red lake. Right? And that would test whether or not we have aluminum in your unknown mix. Well, take a look at the... Uh, um, presentation of the lab demonstration by Professor Hammond and let us know which ions you think we had out of the group three ions. Bye for now. Now we've taken a good look at our unknown 
we should be able to estimate at least some possible known is there and what's not there. And we're going to do a side-by-side -side run of the series of tests to try to qualitatively determine which cations are present in our unknown and which are not. Now remember the known will have everybody. Our first step is to take a large sample and we're going to try to precipitate it. So we're going to do this on both. And I'll do the known first. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 55, 56, 60. Okay. We're supposed to put in approximately three milliliters of the liquid. Um, it doesn't have to be perfectly exact. I always tell students to do about 60 drops. Um, 60 drops is a lot of counting, so I'm just going to make the two liquids about the same level um, for the known and the unknown because we're going to need a centrifuge anyway. Okay, so we have our sample in case we mess up. We can go back and redo it. We have about three milliliters, and now we're going to do some side-by-side -side, um, comparisons. So the first thing is to put in a little bit of hydrochloric acid, approximately 10 drops into each. Okay. Sometimes you'll notice slight color changes due to acidity changes, and I'll put 10 drops in this one. Yep, and again, there seemed to be a slight color change when we added them. Okay, now we are going to add ammonia until it's neutral. And if I was careful counting my drops, it should be approximately the same number of drops, give or take one or two. Okay, so there's my first ten drops. And the procedure says after that, add 10 drops extra. Okay. And again, you'll see, ooh, it's starting to turn kind of a fluffy color. Um, let me move these a little bit closer to the camera. And I'm going to put some white paper down here. Um, but we are definitely in the basic realm because we're starting to make some precipitates that's kind of a... Um, it kind of looks like a translucent blue right now. We're going to do the same thing with the with all six. Okay. So first ten drops should have should about neutralize and put us back to where we were. And we put the next ten drops in. And just to make sure, we're going to have two extra drops. And you'll see this one has distinctly more color in it than the other one, obviously, because it has all six of the ions. There's something missing in this one. Okay, so we've added that, and we're supposed to stir thoroughly. And the easiest way to stir is to put it on the vortex machine. You'll see it spins around really nicely. So we have stirred thoroughly and now we're going to just let it sit and with south centrifuging, we're supposed to let it sit for a few minutes. I'm going to fast forward and we're going to go to adding the thioacetamide. So thioacetamide is a sulfur containing compound. Um, and the IEU pack name is also is um, ethanamide, uh, thioacetamide, but we're going to add now 10, 12 drops. And stir completely. All right. And then we'll add 12 drops to this one.
And we're going to stir completely. Okay. So we've added the thiocetamide. And now we have to put it into the hot water bath for five minutes. And we should be able to easily distinguish which one's which by the colors. But we're going to pause for five minutes now. All right. It has been five minutes since we put it in the hot bath. And I accidentally stopped it, but we want to notice the colors have changed slightly. Remember, color means a lot. And just to ensure complete precipitation, we're going to add another 10 drops of ammonia hydroxide. To each of these. Okay. And we'll stir that up. heat it for about one more minute. I won't pause this time. Just leave that heating. It says heat for a little while. Okay. That's probably enough heating. We've done enough mixing. It's now time for centrifuging. So remember the known with everybody is that reddish color or unknown has this lovely blackish color. Uh, that doesn't mean there's not black in the known, it's just there's other colors overshadowing it. Okay, so we're going to centrifuge. Okay, I should have wrote down the numbers, but that I has that reddish color. I'm going to believe that's the known with everybody. And this one has a lovely black color. So please note the colors. Now, the next stage says to take the decant and supernatin and discard it. However, um, we have often found that the zinc will not precipitate when he's told to and he'll end up in the supernatant. So we're actually going to save the supernatant for some later tests for the possibility of zinc. Uh, there must have been some contamination in my thing, but it shouldn't mess up. Okay, so now that we have decanted off and we saved for possible zinc testing later on, um, we are now ready to do a wash. And Procedure D is the test for the zinc ions, right? So what we're going to do is take the residual R10 and we're going to wash it with um, five mils of DI water, discarding this wash water. Sometimes the precipitates can be what they call colloidal, which are kind of like uh, suspension, milky, uh, less dense solids that don't um, fall to the bottom of the test tube. If that's the case, you can actually disperse the colloid by adding some uh, electrolytes to the solution. So in this case, we would add th a few drops of three molar ammonium chloride. Uh, to the precipitate, um, we're going to add one mil of DI water and a couple of drops of six molar HCl to dissolve it. Uh, we're going to centrifuge and save any residual that didn't dissolve uh, to test for nickel in procedure E. To the S11, we're going to then add one drop of one molar theo, uh, thioacetamide, excuse me, <laughs> and one drop of six molar ammonium hydroxide and stir and heat for five minutes uh, to make sure we have sufficient sulfide ions to drive the reaction. Uh, and then we're going to add some three molar ammonium um, uh, acetate uh, uh, with drops up to about 10 drops with mixing. And if we get a white uh, or light gray precipitate, then we have confirmed that we have the zinc ions. The reactions that we're doing there are shown in the flow chart um, piecemealed part over here. 
uh, we're trying to confirm zinc sulfide over here. This is the summary of the reaction that we just did, um, and with the mouth full of words that were hard to spit out. <laughs> wash step, we will discard this. This will be my discard beaker. So to wash, we're just going to squirt in some water and sent and vortex it in centrifuge. And I want my levels to be about the same. So this is our known, unknown, sorry. And that one's there. And we'll try to do the same volume with the un, with the known. A little more water. Okay. All right, and we're ready to send a few feet. So the known is five, the unknown is two. And I just, we're going to add now some ammonium chloride and some ammonia. So two drops of ammonia. Each. And then my ammonium chloride, two drops into each. All right, we're going to vortex both of these one more time. Save it. Okay. So we are now ready to try to start identifying our different ions. Um, basically, that first step was to remove as many impurities as possible. And the first thing we're going to do is, is we're going to add a sulfate bisulfate mixture. Um, what happens is this bisulfate makes the solution slightly acidic and creates a pseudo buffer. Um, we're supposed to do two milliliters. We're just going to count 40 drops. So okay, there's 40 in that one. There's 40 drops in that one, and we do the same with these, the bisulfate, 40 drops. And 40, okay. 40 drops of each have been added. We're now going to vortex them again to mix up thoroughly with the solid. What will happen is this mixture should dissolve everybody except the zinc and the nickel. Now, that's assuming the zinc's not over there. Uh, you got a kind of a darkish haze. That's very typical of nickel. All the rest of the ions should be in solution. So, I'm do that one. Now, I'm going to do the same thing with this one. This one has even a darker haze. Hmm. I think we have some information. Okay. So now that we mixed them, we're going to centrifuge it, and we're going to have to save the supernatant. The idea here is, is the solid should have the zinc and the zinc and the nickel in it, and any of the liquid will contain the chromium the iron, the aluminum, and the manganese. This one is really in looking interesting. Okay, so levels are about the same. 
don't know how, but this one's a little higher. Let's see, unknown. centrifuge very well. Looks like we're having issues with the zinc. Let me see how the known went. Oh, the known went perfectly, so. I'm going to do something. I forgot to buy sulfur. Okay. Try this one more time. Alright, we have finished centrifuging the mixtures after adding the sulfate and the bisulfate. And again, we're supposed to save the supernatant for later testing. So I'm going to prepare a test tube for each. Um, this is our unknown. So we'll keep track of this to the side. Okay. Not to mix it up with the supernatant we kept from the beginning. Our solid is a nice blackish colored solid. Um, we're going to keep that in test for nickel and zinc. Here we have a kind of a slightly cloudier mixture, but this has everything in it. So we're going to put the supernatant off to the side. We'll set that one right there. And this one the black color we know is supposed to be nickel if there's white in there it could be zinc or the zinc could be back here in this test so what we're going to do is we're going to actually test these for zinc and I'll test these back here for zinc as well um, zinc when it makes a precipitate it's supposed to be white so having a black precipitate is not a positive result for zinc it is a positive possibility for nickel um, so there's a possibility we have nickel um, I'm not sure about zinc because black color is covering everything um, but we'll confirm whether we have uh, nickel or zinc a little later on so what we do now um, is we separated it we're going to add um, some hydrochloric acid and if there is any zinc in here, it should dissolve without dissolving the nickel. Um, that is the catch. So we're going to start first with some drops of ammonium chloride. We need two drops of ammonium chloride. Do that to both of them. Okay. Ammonium chloride has been added. And then we're going to add two drops of the hydrochloric acid. said to stir the mixture. There was not much solution. Okay. Alright. We're going to prepare some small test tubes. Okay. So, after adding the hydrochloric acid, we're going to centrifuge both of these one more time and we're going to save the solid 
and it looks like they both have a black solid and test for the possibility of nickel. And then we're going to take the supernatant, put in these little test tubes, and then test them with these for the possibility of zinc. So what I'm going to do right now is take off the supernatant. Test the black solid. Same with this one. Take off the supernatant. We'll test the black solid later. Okay, now to test for the zinc, what we're supposed to add is some sodium hydroxide. Uh -oh. Pausing video. Okay, we're going to add some sodium hydroxide. Uh, to each of these liquids and what we're looking for is evidence of some sort um, actually what we're going to do is first try to precipitate any excess zinc um, but we're going to look for evidence of um, white precipitate so we're going to do one drop of Sodium hydroxide. And then a drop of thiosetamide. And I accidentally switched them, my bad. <laughs> um, now, looking carefully. This is our unknown. This is the known. Let's look, show that in the film. You'll see there, there's a white cloudiness over here and there's not in the other one. That's a pretty good evidence that, um, that we really have zinc. Um, well, if we have it, what we're going to try to do now is we're going to add some water and redissolve it. This one, I do not see any precipitation at all. So we're going to add some hydrochloric acid. Yeah, it says if this if it's too dark to be certain. This looks like a pretty light gray to me, which we're going to say is our positive zinc test. Of course, it's supposed to be positive because that's our known. So I'm going to leave that one aside. And this one came out really clear. So that means I need to go back and test this one with the exact same test as I did before. Now, black does not count as a precipitate. That actually counts as nickel again. Um, so, I'm going to do the same residue. Um, the known definitely had it. The unknown, hmm, not sure. We had a negative result here. And I should not be answering this, but let's see if we obtain the same negative result here. Now, because of the blacks in here, it's really hard to be certain. So, we're going to try... Um, adding the water. For first I'm going to add the thiosetamide and where'd it go? And the sodium hydroxide again. So we're going back and redoing the procedure. We're adding thiosetamide. Come on, one drop. There we go. And that will help us actually precipitate out the nickel if it's there. And we're going to add some sodium hydroxide. One drop. Okay. All right. And then um, the ammonium acetate up to three drops. So that's as soon as we by drops up to. 10 drops with mixing. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, Mix. Okay. Definitely too dark to see. Um, again, if it's zinc, it's supposed to be white in color. Black is definitely not zinc. Uh, so we're going to now centrifuge against 
blank water. And we're going to try to test the supernatant. Okay, definitely had a dark residue in the solid. I don't see any white in the solid, and we're supposed to decant off the liquid. And we want to see if we can turn the solid into a white color. If it turns white, we have zinc. So, what we're going to do is we're going to add a mill of water, just like we did before because it's too dark. That's about a milliliter. And then add a drop of hydrochloric acid. And then we'll re-precipitate it with the ammonium acetate. Okay. So the dark residue has mostly dissolved. Where'd the ammonium acetate go? Here, ammonium acetate. And so the only thing we're looking for is some sort of white solid. It's either a yes or a no. And if you look carefully at the test tube, you do not see any cloudiness whatsoever. So um, that is our evidence for zinc. Um, and just to give you comparison to the known, you'll see a difference. So we're going to put this test tube aside and we're going to now proceed to test for nickel. We suspect we have nickel because of the black. That's a good um, evidence. Actually, I switched these. Sorry about that. Uh, they both have black in it, which is interesting. So to test for the nickel, um, what we're going to do is um, try to re-dissolve it, and we're going to try to make a complex. Nickel, if you remember, had a bright green color back there, and if you look back here, I'm going to need to bring the nickel forward. So it tends to have colors. When it's a precipitate right now with the sulfide, it should be a black color. What we're going to see is if we can make it change to bright pink or a reddish color. So to do that, we have to take some nitric acid and we have to add some drops to dissolve the solid. The solid should dissolve completely once we've added the right amount of solid. Okay. Or the right amount of nitric acid. Okay, I'm going to add a couple more drops because my solid is not dissolving. Okay, that's that one. Let's do this one. Sure, this is six molar nitric acid. Okay. Now, put these in the hot water bath. Uh, this one comes from one side, this one comes from the other side. They're both floating. We're supposed to heat them. And what the nitric acid should do is dissolve the solids and react with the sulfur. And there we go. And cause the sulfur to precipitate out as an element. So let's keep stirring these around. Seems to be working. Okay. Got some solid stuck up on the side. Okay, let's keep feeding. Reason this 
solid does not want to dissolve. We'll add a couple more drops of the nitric acid. Where did you go? Black solid's gone completely. Another one, the black solid's still in the room. Okay, we're going to pause while we let that sit and cook for about five minutes. All right, we finished heating it down. What we're supposed to do is add a little bit of water, about a milliliter, and we're trying to remove any extra solids. We just want to test what's in the liquid. And if we make sulfides, they tend to stick and precipitate to the glass. So I just like to shake it. Then we're going to take some tiny test tubes. I don't need these anymore. We'll finish with this test. And we just want the liquid. We don't want any of the solids that might be stuck to the glass to perform the next test. So hopefully as much stuck to this test tube as possible. Um, the sulfur did. Uh, normally we boil it till we can't smell sulfur anymore. Uh, actually we're going to do that again on the later stage. All right, I have two little samples here, and what we're going to do is we're going to look to see if we can make that bright pink color I was referring to earlier. That occurs when nickel is present in the presence of dimethylgloxine. So first we're going to have to turn it basic um, with some ammonia. Where's the ammonia hydroxide? There it is. Okay, so I'm going to turn it basic, and I'm going to be watching for color changes too. It looks like there's a little bit of a color change. Alright, we are slowly changing colors, we're not quite basic, whoops, no look is in. But um, we're definitely getting some sort of color change in our in our unknown. Okay, now I'm going to do the same over here. Okay. All right. We've got kind of a bluish tint over here. Okay, you see the purplish pink color there. Ooh. All right. Now they both seem to change. They're both basic. I'm going to centrifuge these and see if there's some solid particles forming but if there's a pink solid particles that's usually positive evidence for nickel okay, one. Yeah, no, two, three. so we're boiling off the sulfur smell at least i hope we are okay this was number six see how the pink precipitate that's a positive nickel I believe that was the known and this one was the unknown okay so we have now concluded our zinc and our nickel test we'll 
put those back here. Um, I need to boil that for a while. Um, and that usually takes up to 10 minutes, so we're going to pause video while we boil it. We're supposed to boil it until you cannot smell any more sulfur or sulfide smell. But I cannot convey smells over the video, so let's just pause. Okay, we've been heating the two test tubes for about 10 to 15 minutes. We're supposed to check to make sure there's no more sulfur smell coming off. It smells pretty good. Okay. All right, and we can notice the colors. Um, the known has a bunch of colors in it. And our very next test is while those are cooling off is we're going to prepare to test for chromium. I, and just a reminder about chromium, chromium has a dark bluish color. I don't know if you can see that on the sides. But when we do the next test with hydrogen peroxide, if there's any chromium, it will turn to a yellow orange color. So to prepare, we're supposed to take and I have the test tube set up to a milliliter of water with a milliliter of sodium hydroxide um, and have those ready to mix together with our liquids here after these finish cooling off. So while they're cooling um, we're going to prepare one milliliter and that's just going to be 20 drops of the sodium hydroxide do 20 drops over here as well. Okay, so we've added our milliliter of sodium hydroxide in the test tube. We're supposed to match it with a milliliter of water. I'm going to just estimate by doubling the volume and do the same over here. All right, now these are still really hot. Um, they were in boiling water so we're going to pause while these cool down to room temperature because we do not want to add the hydrogen peroxide until it's cooled off completely. Alright, <clears throat> we have finished cooling down. They don't feel hot to the touch. Our two solutions. Yep, we are ready now to add the hydrogen peroxide. We have some 30% hydrogen peroxide, and again, we're going to, one of the and only tests we actually have for the chromium ion is if it goes from blue to a yellow orange uh, during this process. So we're supposed to add five drops of the 30% hydrogen peroxide. I know this one has chromium in it because it's the known and you see the blue color is starting to change on me. Should go kind of a yellow orange. I'm gonna just in case the hydrogen peroxide's gone bad, I'm gonna add two three more drops. Okay, so we did a, see some sort of color change with the known. Um, And I know the known had chromium in it because we put everything in it. Okay, let's do the same with this one. Okay, and lastly, I'm going to vortex them both. So, the blue has definitely changed to some color. We'll see if it stays. Now, what we're supposed to do next is um, to the two solutions we made here, we're supposed to pour this into that. So, that's what we'll do now. Whoa. Uh, I forgot the eruption effect. Um, that is the evidence of excess hydrogen peroxide, but the solution, let's look at the color of our unknown, had a nice brownish color. There is a chance the same thing will happen with the known. Um, 
at this stage, anything that's a solid will either be iron or manganese. And if we have liquids, the liquid portion, and there goes the eruption again. You see the lovely evolution of hydrogen gas. We made nice brown color, or uh, reddish brown. So this one we know has both iron and manganese in it. This one has one or the other or both. Hard to tell right now, um, but we did get a nice blackish brown precipitate. You might see, I don't know if your colors tell you, but this one looks a little redder than the other one. That might be important. We'll decide, or it could be just the effect of the chromium, because I do not think we have chromium in the unknown. Um, at least that's what it looks like. So, we're supposed to let that go. Um, and what happens is, you mix it, let, let it stand for a minute, then you're supposed to heat it until it stops fizzing because we're trying to drive away um, the excess bubbling. So we've already, well, Vortex is really fast. We've had our miniature eruptions. Remember the reddish one is the known, the blackish ones are unknown. We're gonna set this in the heater. And I don't know if we can zoom in, but they are now both bubbling vigorously inside. I'll pull the hot water back close just for a minute. You see how the solutions are bubbling vigorously? We're gonna let those continue to bubble for a few minutes and we'll pause the video again. All right, let's see how we're doing. Um, we're looking to see if they're still fizzing. The one on the known is fizzing a little bit. The unknown, hmm. I don't see any fizzing in the unknown, so I'm gonna take it out and start it cooling. The known, we stop the fizzing. It looks basically done as well. So we'll put the known over there. Put our hot water bath. Okay. So at this stage, if we, well, the heat completely steamed up. Having solids can mean either manganese, or sorry, not manganese, we're past that stage. Oh yeah, manganese and iron. The liquid, the supernatant, will contain chromium in its yellow form. You notice how our, this one's yellow, that's our known. If chromium's there, we have now confirmed that chromium's there by the color. And the possibility of aluminum. Aluminum is a colorless ion, so we can't see him. And the same is true over here. Notice that the supernatant is not as yellow as it was in this one. We'll do a side-by-side -side comparison. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to centrifuge and save the supernatant to test for aluminum and then we're going to take the solids and do a test for the iron and the magnesium. Alright, so what I'm going to do is just fill these up to the same level. They're closed with just some pure water. The water's not going to affect the results. So if you're unknown, start it off with a nice bluish tint to it, and you now have a yellowish tint, we've confirmed the presence of chromium. If the unknown had no color and it still has no color, then we confirm the non-existence of chromium. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the lab, chromium should be the one that everyone has the correct answer for. Either you have it or you don't. Okay. So, it looks like our unknown has the possibility of iron or manganese, and we, we know the known has both of them. So, we are known has the yellow top. So, again, this is after centrifuging. We just have this darkish brown residue. No yellow liquid. This one's after centrifuging. A lovely yellow liquid, definitely chromium. And we have the us dark solid on the bottom. So let's decant now. And go through a lot of test tubes in this lab. Keep our decanting separate. So the yellow liquid will go over here. Yeah, it's 
definitely chromium. But that's the known. The known has them all. So, everybody see a positive result of chromium? If you have it, you have that lovely yellow color. We still, <coughs> we'll still <coughs> test for aluminum in there. And on this one, when we decant, I don't, my eyes don't show many yellow. Just have a darkish brown. The brown is coming through. So we'll save that for that later. And with the thing now, let's test our solids for manganese and iron. To test the solids for iron and manganese, we have to add the nitric acid. And this time it should completely dissolve. Um, now, when we added the hydrogen peroxide, one of the things that happened was, and so I'm going to start with the known first, is if we, the manganese that we started with was plus two, he turned to plus four, and he makes the brown precipitate. Um, we're going to change it back in a second to another one. I just need to keep adding nitric acid until our solid dissolves. It's supposed to be 20 drops, so I've done about two. Uh, okay, it's got a lovely brown color. So. All right, I've added 20 drops of the nitric acid. If the solid doesn't completely drop, dissolve, we're supposed to add some 3% hydrogen peroxide. And that's because the manganese 4 oxide is giving us trouble. We'll do that on the known. Let's see what happens to this one or unknown. One, two. Okay, looks like we're having similar issues. I'm going to add two, five extra drops. Make sure my nitric acid has plenty in there. Okay, we have a darkish brownish color. Let's pull out the 3% hydrogen peroxide. Okay, um, uh oh. My 3% hydrogen peroxide is mostly frozen. Okay, I mostly melted the hydrogen peroxide. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, I will go find new hydrogen peroxide. So, we're supposed to just add a couple drops and see if we can get this black color to disappear. Um, 3% hydrogen peroxide should help the manganese to reduce back to manganese 2. That's assuming this hydrogen peroxide. Ooh, there it goes. See the color? Ooh, we're almost there. Maybe one more. No, I'm not going to add any more drop. That's what we're supposed to see. The solution solids dissolved. Okay, let's try this one. like it's starting to work. This is a lot like doing the redox titration, which is coming up a little bit later in this semester.
think we're dissolved enough to go to the next stage. Um, and that is, is you're supposed to take these two and divide them into two equal portions into small test tubes. So one pause while I obtain some small, f okay, I have obtained some smaller Lemire flasks so that I can uh, hold the test tubes while we do the two tests. What we're going to do is we're going to divide this test tube into two parts. So roughly, doesn't have to be exact, about half the liquid goes into each. One will do the iron test, one will do the manganese test. And likewise, we'll do the same for the liquid here. We'll divide it evenly between the two test tubes, and we'll test for those two ions. Okay, so we'll move these out of the way. And we still have the supernatants here that we need to test for the aluminum. Okay, so we'll do the iron test first. We've uh, separated them. Let's save one for later. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for the bright red iron thiocyanate. Now, if you remember the silver acetate lab where we precipitate the silver and then all of a sudden the solution turned red, that was the complex of thiocyanate with iron. So we're going to look for a deep, deep red color. We'll start with the known, so it should give us a red color. Let's see what happens. Ooh, one drop, and it went blood red. Did everybody see that? So that's definitely a positive test for iron. A deep blood red color. Let's test our unknown now. One drop. Well, I'll do a second drop. Second drop. Hmm. Okay, side-by-side -side comparisons, I'm not going to say anything. Okay, the iron test is over. Let's move those back here. Okay. Put it next to the nickel test. All right, let's test for the manganese. Now, the manganese test is a little trickier. That requires a pinch of this yellowish powder. It's called sodium bisulfite. What happens is, if you do it nicely, you kind of want the powder to sit as a clump on the bottom. Now that's easier said than done. Sorry, to sit on the clump on the bottom of the test tube. And then as it sits there, you want to see if the manganese ions goes into the bismate and becomes oxidized to permanganate. Permanganate is a deep purple color. so. It's not just a slight reddening. We should see purple color starting to be emitted off of this yellowish powder. So, everybody see the yellowish powder? We're going to be looking for a purplish emission coming off of that. So, what we'll need is a small spatula, which I will go obtain right now. Okay, we have, I have my small spatula. We're going to try to put in about the size of a half a grain of rice, a powder. We don't want to overwhelm it. And so we'll take the known first because we know it's supposed to work. We drop that in and you see immediately the purplish color starting to form. Um, I don't know if we can make it any closer, but that deep purple color that's being formed as we make more and more permanganate, that is what a positive manganese test should look like. So let's see what happens with our unknown. Again, we're going to use just a small amount of the bismate. We're going to drop it in and we'll watch what happens. And so that is our test for manganese. We'll put 
that over here. So that leaves us one last test. That is the test for aluminum. To test for aluminum, aluminum is an amphoteric substance, especially on its aluminum hydroxide. Um, so what we're going to try to do to test for aluminum is we're going to try to watch, and I'll do the known first, we're going to try to watch if there's ever a slight haziness. Uh, aluminum makes a very light, fluffy precipitate. It's almost colorless. It's uh, technically a white. And so in the middle of this yellow, as I'm changing pH it, from basic to acidic and back to basic, there's a small pH window from about pH 7.5 to 8.5 where aluminum will turn cloudy. So too acidic, it goes clear again. Too basic, it goes clear again. It just has to be just right, um, which makes this test the tricky one. So we'll start with some hydrochloric acid. Um, I know there's aluminum in here because we put it in the num, but we're going to demonstrate what happens. Now ignore the yellow because we know that's chromium. Uh, we're just looking for some haziness as the pH changes back and forth. So another thing that's nice about chromium is if you remember Le Chatelet's lab, he'll turn bright orange when I'm acidic. So um, you acidify it by add, making it turn orange and when you have chromium. Sadly, we don't have chromium here, so it'll be harder to know. Um, and then we're going to add five extra drops. Okay, so first let's see if we can make it turn orange. And while it's changing, I also like to look to see if did we get any fluffy solids for a moment. Um, I know it's supposed to appear, but only for a certain pH range. Oh, we must have added a lot of sodium hydroxide. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. See how the solution's starting to turn orange? It's about halfway there. Let me see if there's any cloudiness. I don't see any. It's really easy to miss aluminum, so. Okay, vortex. Still not quite there. So, are we acidic, yes or no? And the question is, we don't know for sure. I think it's changed to a more orange color. It's definitely not bright yellow. Um, I'm going to add five more drops just to make sure. And then I'll vortex it one last time. Yep, it looks like it's changed. Okay. Um, now, I didn't see any cloudiness, even though I know we did put some um, aluminum in there. But we're going to try to test for it as we make it just basic. But instead of using sodium hydroxide because it's too basic, it'll shoot right past the cloudiness, we're going to use some ammonium hydroxide. It's a little less basic and I'll know if I'm completely basic if the ship color turns bright yellow again. Hmm. I now see why students have a hard time with the aluminum test. I know aluminum's there and I still don't see it. Oh, still on the orange side. Still slightly orange. Okay, I've gone slightly yellow. <laughs> so, my orange color has turned to yellow. I am supposed to be basic, and there it is. The hardest cation to see. I don't know if, um, what I can do to help you see this better, but I, can al I almost need something dark. What do we have? Uh, I'll use this aluminum test reagent. I don't know if you can see inside of that yellow, 
but there's haziness a very faint amount of hazy solid that haziness is the aluminum precipitating that we're looking for um, when I swirl it just slightly I can see there's little clumps of haziness there okay so aluminum makes a fluffy colorless precipitate um, you have to be very careful with the unknown it was already difficult and I already knew this one was there so if I have something that's fluffy to the eye and this one is slightly hazy and I don't know if bringing it up closer helps but I'm gonna or the focus just goes crazy but you can see there's some fluffiness some stuff floating around inside of that test tube that's what I'll be looking for for inside the unknown okay so it's very difficult to detect the pH window is extremely precise you only have like one pH range to do it and if you have some what you're going to try to do is, is collect it and condense it so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a test to see if I can make it fluffier with one more drop of ammonium hydroxide okay so I added one more drop I'm going to spin it around and I run a risk because oops I went too far the haziness has gone away and it's gone clear that's okay I can make it go back if I added a drop of hydrochloric acid so I'm going to add one drop of hydrochloric acid uh, come on dropper stir it all together okay the hydrochloric acid did neutralize it and I'm starting to see little floaties inside again okay I'm gonna add one more drop um, when the procedures say it's very sensitive pH it is extremely sensitive pH okay so I'm gonna let that sit and now I'm going to try to do it on our unknown. Okay, we'll save the aluminum region for a minute. All right, we first start off by adding the hydrochloric acid. Um, since I don't have chromium in there, I actually am going to need some litmus paper. And so I'll be right back with the litmus paper. Okay, I have the litmus paper. I have a string rod. Uh, we're going to set out some blue litmus paper. Hopefully I won't contaminate it with my fingerprints which are always slightly acidic. Oh, I'll just leave them there. Um, and then for later on I'm going to set out some red litmus paper for the other half. So again, what we're going to try to see is if we can see in a moment some fluffiness. If we can, we're going to try to, to test for aluminum um, when we get to that stage. So, first, some hydrochloric acid. Um, we want to acidify with hydrochloric acid. I don't have anything to change color, so I'm going to just guesstimate. I'm going to start with five drops. I'm going to mix that all together. See if there anything went cloudy. Ooh, wait a minute. It looks like it looks like there's some cloudiness in there. There's a possibility of aluminum. I'm not saying for sure, but that's an interesting look. Um, because it's cloudy, it actually tells me it's still slightly basic. So I'm going to add a drop of hydrochloric acid until that cloudiness just disappears. So, one drop, and did the cloudiness just disappear? It did. Um, pH change with a drop of hydrochloric gas it completely made that solid disappear. So that makes me more suspicious that we possibly have aluminum. Still not positive, but there's a possibility because we're now clear. So we've added it. 
and now we add five drops of excess just like the procedure C one two three four five we stir that all together and we have an acidic solution of precipitate so let's now see if we can get that cloudiness back by adding the ammonium hydroxide um, we should be able to make it just barely basic by adding a drop at a time. I am going to actually start with five drops because that's what my excess was. Okay, I'm going to stir that all together. And again, we're looking for any evidence of fluffiness. I always hold it against the dark countertop and it looks perfectly clear. So, I suspect I'm still on the acidic side. So, I'm going to do a fast pH test. Yeah, the paper turned basically pink and didn't turn blue. Okay, so let's save that. Let's add another drop, one drop at a time. We want to barely make the pH paper turn blue. And when it's right around a pH of 8, we might get fluffiness if there's aluminum. Um, so time for a pH test. Uh, it looks like it's still slightly acidic. Yep, I'm not seeing any base, any blue on my paper. Yep, it's still slightly acidic. Time for another drop. Yeah, drop. Mix it all together. Look for fluffiness. Ooh, I'm starting to see fluffiness. You see how that went hazy all of a sudden? I don't know if I bring it closer, you can tell, but um, there's a slight haze to it. I'm going to do a quick pH test, see if we've crossed over to the basic side, and yes, we have. It is turning slightly blue. Yeah, my pH paper is turning slightly blue, so I have probably just barely crossed over from the 7 to the 8 zone, which is about what's needed to see if there's any type of aluminum. If you hate, we have it, to make sure that you have a positive test, you have to work on the pH. Okay. Um, now, what we want to try to do is collect the solid. I'm going to, since this is pH sensitive, and I barely crossed the line, I'm going to try one more drop of ammonia to see if it goes a little cloudier. Because I run the risk that it goes completely clear again because I go past the magic pH zone. Nope, I still have cloudiness. We'll see if it fluffs up more. But I don't want to risk it again because I'll probably be too cloudy. Now, if you go past it, you can reverse the pH by adding hydrochloric acid. So, it doesn't look as cloudy as it was before. I'm going to add one drop of the hydrochloric acid, just one drop at a time. Mix it all together and see if we can get some cloudiness. Again, if we overshoot it, it will go completely clear. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to actually mix this one more time. Yeah, there's some cloudiness in there. Do I dare add another drop? The question always is, what's the right perfect pH to maximize your precipitate? If it's there. Okay. I think that looks like about the cloudiest as I can obtain it. Um, there's a nice haze showing up. I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully, they'll be able to zoom in. Um, but there's a nice hazy. It's kind of fluffy inside. Um, I don't know if holding my hand, you can see that. Um, but we'll look at it after centrifuging. So, This one has some fluffy stuff in it. This one has some fluffy stuff in it. I do not want to add extra water. So I'm going to use my water test tube and centrifuge these separately. 
but the goal is is try to collect that solid at the perfect pH. So we're going to do the unknown because this is more important because we want to verify that we actually have aluminum and not just suspect it. After centrifuging, look what we have. We have a nice clump. So we did have something that was all fluffy in there. We're going to decant off this liquid. And we're going to test the fluffy stuff that we collected to see if it actually is aluminum. Okay. Now, I'm going to do the same thing with the known. Hopefully we're in the fluffy stage. It's really hard to know for sure. I think we are. So I'm balance my test tubes. Okay. There's a little bit of cloudiness on the bottom. Again, we're going to decant off the supernatant. We only want the, the solid, that lovely yellow liquid, that's chromium. But we do have a almost colorless, hazy liquid uh, solid down here that we'll test for aluminum. Now, I know he has aluminum. Let's just verify this one. So, the procedures say to add a milliliter of hydrochloric acid. The actual best procedure is to add one drop at a time until all the solid has disappeared. Um, okay. Now, I'm going to take the known first because I don't care what happens to known. I know it already has aluminum in it. So I'm going to add one drop of hydrochloric acid. Add that. Stir it up. Did that dissolve everything? Almost. Add a second drop. Stir it up. That dissolved everything. So it took me two drops and everything went clear. There's kind of a haze and the orange color is also indicative that the chromium has changed pH. Okay, now that um, I've added it slightly acidic, I just need two drops of the aluminon reagent. One, two, and under acidic conditions it's kind of an orange color. And then we're going to reverse the process. We're going to make it barely basic by adding the ammonia. So it should take no more than two drops. One, two, okay. And I'm going to centrifuge that all together. Very good and, or sorry, vortex it. We're going to centrifuge it to look for a red lake. So that's the known. Let's do the same thing now to our unknown and we'll do them simultaneously centrifuge. Okay, first, minimum drops to dissolve it. Whoops, one drop. Is it all dissolved? It looks all dissolved. Okay. Um, now two drops of the aluminon reagent. This is aluminon. One, two. 
perfect. Okay. And then the ammonia to just barely go basic again. Again, it should be no more than two drops. And we'll stir it all together. All right, yep, I see cloudiness reforming. All right, so what we're looking for is called the red lake effect. All right, so the unknown we'll put into number three. The unknown goes into number six. Let's centrifuge it. So the known was in six. You see the red bottom of that test tube? That's called the red lake. And it looks like the unknown doesn't have the yellow liquid on top. The known has the yellow liquid on top. Again, that's from the chromium. But I'm going to spin it over so you can see that there is a red precipitate that only happens when you have aluminum with aluminum. So, that is our final test and that concludes this experiment. We now, you should be able to positively say yes or no to all six of the possible cations that was in the unknown. And I'm just going to leave those there and you can look at them for the final seconds.